Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Albert Cho. Recently, the Philippine President Bongbong Marcos engaged in discussions with Chinese President Xi Jinping at the APEC summit. Shortly after, the Philippines commenced a tri-day cooperative maritime patrol with the United States. This was prompted, uh, succeeded by the commencement of the first joint maritime and aerial monitoring operation with Australia. Joining us today are Liu Fu Guo, National Zhengzhi University Research Fellow in International Relations and Taiwan Center for Security Studies Director, and Ronan Fu, Academic Seneca, Institute of Political Science Assistant Research Fellow. A very warm welcome to both on the show. President Xi Jinping actually he met with uh, President uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. of the Philippines uh, in the APEC summit, an event that President Marcos highlighted even in his own uh, in Instagram that follows months of increased tension in the South China Sea between Manila and Beijing. Mm -hmm. So with the U.S. vowing to support the Philippines, so I wonder, is this a show of the change of the heart by Marcos, maybe Professor Liu? Uh, basically, my observation is President uh, Marcos Jr. is in a very difficult situation. Inside the uh, Philippines, uh, obviously there are two different boys, one following through the former president of uh, uh, Duterte, preferring engaging more with China, which uh, consider as a pro-China uh, political force inside the Philippines, but on the other side, increasing much a wider public opinion, supporting uh, the Philippines would have to uh, engage more and follow the U.S. Uh, policy guideline. So in this particular sense, we have uh, seen from early this year, President uh, Marcos Jr. visited Beijing had uh, such a summit with President Xi Jinping already. But immediately after that, uh, bilateral relations turns into such a difficult situation. China has a uh, beef up military presence mm. in the South China Sea, closer to the, uh, the Philippine side. But of course, uh, gradually generating into such a clash surrounding a number of uh, ro uh, reef and rocks, especially Second Thomas Shelf. But of course, uh, taking this uh, particular occasion, APEC summit, it is uh, very important for President Marcos uh, Jr. Uh, to meet with President Xi Jinping, at least engaging with Chinese leaders in this particular occasion. But I, I think people are saying that President uh, Marcos Jr. is now siding with the U.S. more. Uh, so we can see, starting from last year, he took over the office and then gradually move on with more agreement and much a closer relationship with the United States. So, you know, if I don't get you wrong, I, you know, you basically argue that uh, the dialogue between uh, the pow two powers, Philippine, the Philippines and China, would gradually decrease the tension between the two nations regarding the South China Sea. Basically, hmm. uh, as long as the uh, top leaders of uh, these two countries engage, the tension should be gradually mm -hmm. quiet down. Mm -hmm. But of course, my observation is this uh, summit alongside with the APEC summit may be just uh, considered as a diplomatic courtesy call. They would exchange view uh, and also reminding each other something critically important for their national security, that's okay. all. But of course, building on the uh, grassroots and also on the ground, China is now beefing up. Uh, the Philippines, supported by the U.S., is also increasing their presence and also push to the Chinese side. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is something I have expected, mm -hmm. something coming on the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, Professor Fu, what, what about you? Uh, what's your uh, preliminary uh, observation of the two countries' uh, conflict in the South China Sea? Yeah, the, the future, uh, how the future is going to unfold is up in the air, but I would argue that President Marcos is actually working a diplomatic uh, tightrope with China and the United States. So on the one hand, the actually the, the epic summit or meeting is more than just a formal gathering. Is a I would argue that is a nuanced diplomatic move by the Philippines, mm -hmm. trying to engage in China while at the same time trying to be mindful of the regional dynamics in the Asia Pacific. On the other hand, as uh, Professor Liu has uh, argued, and I fully agree that you know joining the the American military drills is a quite savvy move. It demonstrates that, okay, so all the regional countries are, are pretty much on 
you know, on the same boat that, you know, we try to mm. contain China's maritime assertiveness. So mm -hmm. the reason why it's a savvy move is that it tries to engage China first, then, you know, try not to put all the uh, eggs on the same basket. So I would argue that it's a quite, you know, balanced and in a way you can argue that the Philippines is trying to hedging. Okay, so it looks uh, like the Marcos tries to play the two-handed approach to deal with the issue. I in fact, that Marcos maintains that the Philippines, the Philippines will not surrender any of its island, uh, a position that seems uh, more resolute compared uh, to his predecessor. So as two of you already mentioned, but is it more, uh, more or less more like straightforward for me to argue or for anybody to view Marcos as a president taking a tougher stance than uh, press, uh, past the leaders of the Philippines in South China Sea? Um, basically, Every one of the claimants already insists no any inches of uh, sovereignty would be given away. So what I see uh, President Marcos Jr. currently is a re-emphasize mm. what uh, this uh, statement has been uh, told by previous uh, uh, president. Mm. But of course, uh, his uh, predecessors uh, projected a different approach. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Philippines has not really stepped back with this uh, sovereignty issue at all, but it's just uh, in a different, uh, different way to show that the Philippines prefer to engage with China and just uh, leave a side of a sovereign uh, dispute with China. Mm -hmm. Because uh, now, as I mentioned, every one of the claimant would not uh, really give any inches uh, sovereignty away to anybody. So basically, this is a dead end. No any p possibility to move any further. Mm -hmm. from there. Okay, um, uh, the South China Sea has become a hot spot of the naval tension between the USA and China, mainly because it's a route for over three trillion USD in annual maritime trades. China claims nearly all of the South China Sea, while uh, there are other countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, even Taiwan claims part of it. So my next question uh, goes to uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Fu is that what does the Philippines' engagement in extended joint naval and uh, aerial patrols with the USA? And now we see there's another role uh, taken by Australia, kind of jumping. What does that signal? What 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 is what is the signal about uh, the role of Australia? You know, jumping into the uh, the competition uh, with China. Yeah. So uh, before I directly answer this question, I would like to make the case very clear that uh, I would argue that. President Marcos is trying to assert a more firmer and you can argue that a more nationalistic stance on the sovereignty issues. Uh, so we have to understand you know, the, how they engage with the USA and, and also Australia from that front. So as I said, I think uh, the Philippine strategic uh, move, it suggests a realignment uh, with the un United States and Australia. Uh, this is due to the regional security concern mm. uh, that the Philippines and perhaps all other regional uh, countries possess. Uh, to elaborate, this active participation in joint uh, military exercises is a strategic pivot. Mm -hmm. uh, I would argue that it reflects a re assessment of the regional security landscape. Mm -hmm. So basically, as China appears to be more assertive, you are going to see more and more joint exercises conducted by uh, regional countries alongside with United States and perhaps Australia. And you are going to see more moves per perhaps uh, made by Japan and South Korea. And obviously the, the U.S. serving as the, the national leader. So as a whole, basically it serves as a counterbalance to uh, China's maritime assertiveness. That's very clear. Mm -hmm. And I think I would also, you know, pick back on Professor Liu's argument that it sort of uh, signifies the general regional trend toward that exercise that, you know, uh, we are going to safeguard our national sovereignty. Uh, no single inch will be yielded. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, prof Professor uh, Fu, could you kind of uh, further elaborate, you try to uh, you know, walk in, in for another 100 miles uh, in the shoe of Australia, just to use that expression, uh, to think about the Australia's calculation. Uh, when Australia uh, Prime Minister, also their government, uh, decides to jump in this uh, operation, you know, together with not only Philippines but also the United States, mm -hmm. uh, in intervene the issue uh, about the South China Sea. 
what's the strategy of Australia and what the goal they try to achieve in the long run or maybe in the short term? Okay, so basically I think Australia alongside with all the countries arguably in Asia Pacific, uh, they are all facing a very, very fundamental China challenge or China mm -hmm. problem, if you will. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, China certainly poses challenges on the security front. Uh, look at you know uh, what China has been doing in the East and South China Seas, and perhaps across the Taiwan Strait. But on the other hand, China remains an economic giant that you have to take into account. So Australia, just like other countries, has to strike a pretty good balance uh, between these two considerations. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you are going to see that they're trying to join the forces led by uh, Japan and the United States. And the reason for that is because at the end of the day, uh, Australia is trying to safeguard the, the role-based or the liberal-led uh, international order. So that is what they try to prioritize. But on, this, on the other hand, you are going to see you know, some very savvy economic or diplomatic engagement with China will are uh, is going to be observed in the future at mm -hmm. the same time. Okay, yeah. Professor Liu, would you uh, also uh, follow the same uh, track by introducing a little bit about the role of Australia mm -hmm. in the issue of South China Sea? How, yeah. how do Australia? Uh, very interestingly, as uh, <coughs> many of us remember, uh, Prime Minister Albanese of uh, Australia lately just uh, visited uh, China trying to resume uh, such a uh, um, uh, discord between Australia and China mm -hmm. developed uh, s starting from his uh, predecessors. China has uh, already put up a number of uh, sanctions against Australia, banning Australian food and wine uh, imported to China. But in a sense, Australia is a critical because uh, China is the number one trading partner for Australia. And I, I said interesting because uh, on diff two different levels, on the uh, superpower level, the US helped uh, Australia together with the United Kingdom uh, form this uh, AUKUS as a military allies, helping Australia to build uh, nuclear submarines in the next uh, few years. So this is one side, Australia firmly joining this uh, regional allies, preparing for the worst if uh, something happened in between the US and China, or China is uh, happening, uh, disrupting the regional order, Australia will play a certain uh, significant role. This is uh, something I said on the overarching structure. Mm -hmm. But on the bilateral level, we can see something different because Australia needs to survive Therefore, the Prime Minister, after uh, taking over the office for one year and, and uh, uh, three, four months, mm -hmm. he decided to travel to China, mm -hmm. meeting with Xi Jinping, and then starting trying to re resume such a cozy trading relations with China. So obviously, as I can see, the US uh, President Joe Biden uh, met with President Xi Jinping in the sideline of uh, uh, Apex Summit. So obviously, Australia is uh, duplicating such an uh, engagement. In between China and Australia, mm -hmm. there is uh, some area they will come from, they will compete, mm -hmm. but certain area, trade in particular, uh, China and also Australia would have to work together. This is uh, on the basis of uh, mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. I think it's quite interesting for us to observe the two countries, the Philippines and Australia. Both countries uh, deal with China uh, does not only unilaterally aggressively, uh, but also you know sometimes they soften the tone against China, mm -hmm. especially with regard to you know developing a dialogue with the uh, President Xi Jinping. We also see the uh, trends like that. Uh, you know the President Biden. He sort of like uh, after the uh, meeting with Xi in San Francisco, sort of kind of walking in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's worthwhile for us to you know, keep attention on, on all the dynamic, uh, not only on South China Sea, but also the relationship between these great powers. Yes. But in fact, we can never uh, forget that Australia has dispatched the HMAS to Umba and the P-8A uh, maritime reconnaissance aircraft for patrols. So in other words, uh, the capacity level of military equipment Australia used to go against China has been increasing. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, maybe uh, Professor Fu, could you say that the military tension did not really decrease? 
yeah. uh, between China and, and, and Australia? Yeah, I would, I would argue that uh, so a real war is unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just put it, put it on the table first. But I do, s I do think that you know, some um, you know, accidental uh, small-scale military skirmishes uh, are you know, likely to happen if you know, some unanticipated you know, events were to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do see you know, some, you know, I would not say it's you know, large scale, but you know, small scale military confrontation or at least competition is going on. Uh, especially, you know, you have to uh, basically consider the U.S. factor into consideration because a lot of times the reason why Australia is doing something usually is because of the, for example, the request from the United States. So usually you don't want to see the two joints competing against each other. The one of the joints will actually try to sometimes uh, play the, you know, proxy card. You know, I'm not going to engage you uh, up from, but I'm going to utilize one of my ally mm -hmm. to compete with you. And Australia precisely served that role uh, very nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would argue that everything uh, is up in there, but you know, some military competition uh, is happening, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, skirmishes uh, yeah. instead. Okay, um, let's bring the role of Taiwan into the scene. Um, uh, you, you know, we wonder, what might yielding any territory on the, on the parts of CCP may complicate the CCP's approach to Taiwan and, and to the Taiwan Strait in general? We're, we've been very clear about the CCP's stance on Taiwan is that there's no room for um, further arguments about Taiwan is part of China and, and, and the national name is going to be the, the uh, PRC instead of the, the, uh, the, the Taiwan's name. Okay, so. Do, do you see any connection between the, the Taiwan Strait and also the uh, South China Sea? And is it any kind of link for uh, Xi Jinping to surrender the rights uh, or claim over the South China Sea will influence his uh, dealing or approach to, toward Taiwan? Uh, for, for many years, in the South China Sea surrounding uh, neighboring countries, I discovered <coughs> one of the emerging nationalism happening in China, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, and even in Malaysia, mm. becoming uh, so difficult for this country to discuss or concess any inches to, to other countries. Mm. So basically, if uh, we are uh, simulating whether President Xi Jinping might consider uh, in the scenario of uh, South China Sea, step back a little bit and in order to win the uh, confidence and also support from other country, I found this is uh, almost impossible. Mm. If uh, President Xi Jinping were a step back, I don't think he would be supported uh, by 1.4 million mm. Chinese people because uh, this uh, consensus is extremely high uh, to protect uh, sovereignty. It's a very, very high topping on all the policy agenda. So including Taiwan, as you just mentioned, I don't think there is uh, any leaders in China. We just uh, uh, skip uh, this uh, agenda not to push on. So I do think uh, one of the difficult things uh, for people living outside of China is we really do not know when or how important Taiwan and South China Sea putting together which one will come first mm. for China to decide because uh, both uh, specific issue are the core interests of uh, PRC, uh, China. So in this sense, uh, China will just uh, continue uh, do whatever they have been doing. I don't think uh, the current leaders under Xi Jinping would have uh, uh, any different approach. But of course, interesting point is China currently is advocating negotiation on the code of conduct in the South China Sea. On this particular diplomatic effort, China may uh, soften its uh, presence or its uh, real action mm. pushing other country for the time being. But I, I think this negotiation is going on and probably also presenting uh, a double hand. On the one side, China will try their uh, best in, uh, effort to protect everything mm. by sending up uh, Coast Guard ships, um, conducting law enforcement 
pushing the Philippines, Malay, Malay and also Vietnamese uh, fishing boat and other boats out of the so-called 10 dash mm -hmm. lines mm -hmm. now. Okay, th that's been very clear to me, but I actually have a, a, uh, another curiosity for uh, Professor Fu is that um, we all know that in international relations, the primary interest uh, is not, uh, it, it's not easy for a, a national leader to surrender the primary interest, right? But secondary interest uh, might be an option. Right. So, so what about Xi Jinping's uh, secondary uh, interests when uh, de deal with other countries like the United States, the Philippines, Australia, that uh, y you know could, could be a trade-off between uh, the two powers, uh, um, kind of soften the tension a little bit? Uh, w w what's what's your answer to this? Yeah. So I would say that staying in power and maintaining the the continuation of the ruling of the CCP mm -hmm. uh, is the most important topic on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just sort of to piggyback on Professor Liu's argument, I would, I would n you know, add that basically the, the reason why you are going to see some firm stains uh, being observed from the Chinese side is that they have made it very clear that sovereignty and, you know, uh, regardless it's been, you know, the Taiwan issue with the South China Sea, uh, they are, I they are, right within the domain or boundary of uh, China's core national interest. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why you are not going to see them trying to surrender, uh, you know, an inch of the, you know, contested, you know, water or even land. Uh, interestingly enough, if you look at the history, China actually made a couple of uh, compromises with, you know, other countries, okay. but the conflict has been only land. China has rarely made any compromises any yeah, in marine time dispute, mm -hmm. let alone the, the, the Taiwan issue. What yeah, about so trade? Sorry to yeah. cut you off, but what about trade? Uh, is it possible for, say, uh, CCP to surrender the trade uh, interest uh, on a part of China, you know, in, in, in uh, as an appeasement to great powers like the United States or Australia by saying that, okay, now I surrender this part of the interest and don't touch my core interest, which is South China Sea and also Taiwan. Yeah, that's entirely possible. In fact, there are, there's actually a, so there's a, a couple of professors and think tankers in DC and, and also elsewhere in the United States trying to promote uh, a notion that you know the United States can actually have a grand bargain with China, because they know that China would try their very best to defend you know their claim over China and perhaps South China Sea. But they know that the CCP, regardless of leader uh, who he or she may be, they are willing to make sacrifices. For example, in trade, mm -hmm. in exchange for the U.S. support, uh, for you know uh, not trying to get intervened for example, in the Taiwan issue. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I would agree with you that China will be willing to make some economic sacrifices mm -hmm. if in return they can have a U.S. stance in their favor. I mm -hmm. think that's entirely possible. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship between Xi Jinping and also President Biden. Uh, they actually uh, had a meeting in San Francisco and that was viewed as a uh, you know, reduced uh, tension between the two great powers particularly after they agree all uh, about creating a military hotline. Mm -hmm. So what are the chances that the disputes in the South China Sea might disrupt the thawing relationship uh, already uh, is set up or established between U.S. and China? What we learn, uh, even if uh, there is uh, resuming the dialogue mechanism between President Xi Jinping and President Joe Biden, the hotline, and also in between U.S. Uh, military and Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army, so in a uh, different level, they can now resume this uh, contact. Um, however, say that uh, the relations is uh, complicated. Chinese uh, also understand they can discuss and resume this uh, dialogue. Uh, main purpose is trying to manage the differences and also control the crisis on the ground. So in the scenario of uh, South China Sea, what I see is we should not expect uh, U.S. and China would be able to find agreement on the South China Sea mm. territorial dispute at all. They are actually trying to find way to manage a crisis just uh, uh, in case na naval vessels or aircraft in the air might run into some accidental incident, then spot into something they cannot control or expect it. 
So this is uh, more, all the more important. But I think looking into the US and China, two superpowers, I know with these uh, large ar armies they have, they normally will follow certain rule of uh, engagement and also such a code of uh, conduct between uh, US and Chinese military. So uh, after they resume and dialogue on certain issue, I do feel more comfortable because uh, all the crisis happening in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. we're just uh, following uh, what we've seen in the past, but it will not uh, escalate it into direct conflict. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, Professor Fu, are you uh, <coughs> pretty quick uh, kind of recapture, help us to understand the, the post uh, summit uh, in San Francisco between US and China relations. You know, how are they going to develop in the next year? Because it, it's the end of this year already. Yeah, so I would say that the, the establishment of the, the hotline is really key. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it doesn't really uh, resolve all the conflicting uh, positions or interests. But the, the, the very fact that we now have a hotline, actually, it signifies the intent to avert unintended uh, escalation. So on that front, I think it serves as a very good risk management uh, mechanism or measure, if you will. Okay, Professor Liu, Professor Fu, th thank you for the important comments in the show. In this episode, we have talked about the continued tension in the South China Sea following the Biden Xi meeting in San Francisco. The tension involves not only the Philippines, China, and the US, but also Australia. We also compared the conflict in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. Did you enjoy our show? Leave us a message and subscribe to Taiwan Talks. See you soon.